Welcome everyone to another edition of Stand Alone. And really what we dive into is our ability to go from ordinary to extraordinary. And in order to do that, I only want to bring extraordinary guests into our presence so we can learn from and really dissect what that process is. And today we have the honor and privilege of having Tom Shea with us. You know, Tom, you are 23 years of service, a retired Navy SEAL. So first I want to say thank you for your service. You know, you were training the snipers, you were involved in that program. You know, the things that you have done, I've listened to combat stories with you, which I just have so much respect for what you have done, what you have overcome. You've put your lessons into two amazing books. So one of them is Unbreakable, and this is the one we're gonna focus on today. Now, I don't often say this, and I'm gonna say this to you guys today. You know, sometimes I read, and I'm like, just let me get through this, right? You know, let me, I gotta get the material downloaded into me. And then there's other times where I'm reading, underlining, noting, then putting tabs on it. And then this book here though, my children will be reading this book. So I just want to commend you for your powerful words, because I believe Tom, that if we can impact people and the way they think we can change their life. And I know we share so many same principles and values, and that's what standalone is really all about. It's not about being alone, but it's about listening to your voice and what you say to yourself so you can lead your life as opposed to all the noise in the world. And so I just want to thank you, number one, for your service. I want to thank you for your time today. And I really want to kick this off by diving into how you were trained to develop a lot of the principles that you share with people in your amazing company, Unbreakable Leadership. Now you're getting businesses to go to an elite level. But I know that you have gone through Hell Week five times. My audience is very aware of what Hell Week is and just what you have to endure through. And, you know, if you can teach us, you know, how you develop principles through going through that, that started to chisel out your character and then started to give you principles that you then wrote in a book for your children to be able to read and develop themselves. So welcome. And if we can kick off with that question, that would be great. How did you gain these principles first off? Well, thank you, Sabrina, for the grace of uh, the introduction to the point where you asked about 15 questions and I was trying to write down which one you wanted. Yes, that's how uh, I roll. <laughs> uh, I, 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 ordinary to extraordinary is, I think, the greatest human condition that we all share or normal to above normal, however you want to articulate that. Uh, I don't see having trained hundreds of great human beings in the SEAL teams uh, from executives on the outside, people who weren't in a leadership status and, and given them leadership skills. There's nothing that you can't learn in life. Everything from the point you're three years old to however old you are is learned very little is genetically given except maybe hair, but we can screw that up too. Yeah. Like we can do bad things in our life and not have any access to our genetics. So, uh, I truly think people learn from failure. They never learn from success. And that's the antithesis of where everybody is in the world. Everybody thinks you have to win to, to learn. Everybody thinks they, you have to be given something or right now society is giving people stuff without earning it. So it's a tragedy that we're seeing this in our lifetime. Uh, but the opposite of it is you can learn anything, but you have to fail as long as it takes to win. If you want to be a good runner, start running. Don't complicate it. Get out of your own way and start running. If you want to be healthy, Google how to be healthy and then do it for a long time and don't do the other stuff that's on the other side of the page of not healthy. So I learned, uh, and the SEAL teams are only about failure. They're not interested in winning. They're interested in putting you through losing situations and seeing what you're going to do. And then can you build yourself back up after you've lost? And then can you go down again 
and prevent hitting rock bottom? Can you keep going into those hell week conditions and then end up looking like a rose garden at the end? So the SEAL teams are the greatest founding place for hardness because you have to feel how soft you are constantly to get to a position that you're hardened mentally. And that's not what people think. Mm -hmm. People think that you're born hard and then you're chiseled into this by other hard people like iron makes iron or, or steel makes steel, whatever that biblical reference is. It's actually the opposite is you have to feel how bad things are going to get. And then you have to start over. And when you do that, and you see that in business as well. It's what you do after you lose that matters. It's not how many wins you have in a row. It's what you do after, oh my God, I lost $20 million. Are you going to start tomorrow or are you going to keep doing the bad things that lost you the, the, the millions? And that's what I think human character is designed around. You're supposed to fail. That's how I would answer that. Yeah. I, you know, I wanted to ask you, what is the symbolism of having that bell there and then making that person walk up to that mm. bell and then ring it, I believe three times, you yeah. know, why do they do that? Why is it designed that way? Uh, there's a lot of designs for it. The original guy, a guy named Draper Kaufman wrote the hell week curriculum back in the thirties before world war two. And, uh, he knew something that has been lost in time is that uh, it doesn't matter if you quit inside. It's matter, it matters what you say outside. Because the moment you go up in front of somebody and say, I quit, it's over. Mm -hmm. You can quit inside a thousand times. Like if you and I were married, I could go, man, I hate going home a thousand times. But when I say it in front of you, like Sabrina, we're done, it cannot be revived. Yeah, it changes. So they make, the guy, even though, Hey, I quit. No, you got to go and say it in front of everybody. So the whole class gets to witness you quitting. And the words are, I drop on request. If you ring the bell, you got to do it three times because it's not a hidden thing. Don't kind of ring the bell do it. In and everybody stops what they're doing and looks at you and watches you. And then you say, I drop on request. Like I request to leave. And, uh, one is language humans with, with their words, transform everything. Mm -hmm. And that is what I teach. Language drives everything. If you can master language, you can do anything literally. Yeah. I really want to get into this because <clears throat> in the book, you go through a journey though, where you, um, you wanted to get into ultra running and then you meet someone, which I think says a lot about you too. Like at that elite level, when a Navy SEAL is coming up to you and saying like, teach me this skill, it has to be intimidating for that person. And even that trainer, that mentor that you had said, like, I'm only working with you because you are a Navy SEAL and I know you'll take this serious, but you learn so many lessons from him. And one of the things that he always did was he got you back on track to keep it simple, mm -hmm. you know, and this really blends into what you're teaching, you know, businesses, people that just want to lose weight, people that want to be a better version of themselves. Mm -hmm. Like we are complicating something simple and, you know, you, you talk about the words that we use that we specifically say to ourselves. can you share with our audience, you know, my audience are go-getters. We're mm -hmm. entrepreneurs. We're people that want to be the best at what we do. And then we want to get better. What is, what is the power in the simplicity of the words that we say and declare? Mm. I love that you say that word mm. that we declare mm -hmm. on ourselves. Uh, how do I do it succinctly with that? I I've tried to solve this quickly it takes me a day so I'm, you're asking me for the three minute rendition yes uh be careful using these two words in a sentence because the third word is catastrophic or wonderful so the moment you say i am in a sentence the next word defines you if you say i am happy, then it is so for you. 
If you say, I am tired, that's it today. You're there. You'll be tired. If you say, I am broken, I can't do this, which is me saying I am unworthy. If you ever say that to yourself or out loud, that defines you and nobody can convince you the other way. And if you hear people that are successful, they, they're very clear, I am successful. I'm wealthy. They'll say it. Uh, I'm the best in the world, which is, you know, the Muhammad Ali. Uh, Mike Tyson, he said it out loud. Uh, every successful man or woman, when they are experiencing success, say it. And they're very careful to not let anybody counter that. So don't let anybody into your circle that's telling you you aren't going to make it. You're unworthy or you're trying to lose weight and your parents remind you how fat you are, or your husband is telling you, no, this isn't going to work. Uh, so the I am statement when it gets penetrated is catastrophic to human beings. And I say that because that's the only thing that I teach people now, be careful what you say to yourself. And it's like a prayer. When you say I am happy, you're asking for that to be the part of your day. If you want a million dollars, tell yourself you're a millionaire and you say it long enough, the world will transform into that space. You'll have to get rid of everybody that's a naysayer. And at the end of it, you'll have three people left in your life. Pretty much that's what will happen. Yes. So <clears throat> the, the wording, the declaration statement is a, a part of a, a formula that you were born with. Everybody has this coding inside of them that they say who they are. Whoever you think you are physically, that's what you do. And you can shape that word. You say, I'm not healthy. I guarantee you're proving it to the world. If you say you're too old, you've already proven it to the world. And I've, I take clients through that journey of, if you want to be an ultra marathon runner, put it down on paper. It will happen. Doesn't matter if you're 400 pounds. Doesn't matter if the doctor tells you no. If you want to swim the English Channel. Anything that you are willing to commit to, I'm more interested in getting behind that than listening to 10% or what the world sells, tells you about you. And that was about as quick as I can do that I am declaration statement. Yeah, I think what happens too, we get into this place where we are looking to build ourselves. And you know, today in, in the world that we live in, there's a lot of victimhood. There's a lot of- Terrible people that are like just programmed to think that they're at a disadvantage. Yep. And I wanted to hear your opinion on this because, you know, when people start to do this with me, I completely like back away. And now after reading your book, it was, it's almost like a protective thing for me. It's not that I don't care to hear your story, mm -hmm. but it, you, you got to be careful what you attach to and what you agree with. Cause it grows. Like what, are, what are your oh, thoughts? Yeah. That when victims you're, are you're asking thinking. what do you do when a victim somebody comes up with I'm a victim conversation? Yes. Agree with them. Like, yes, you are. You are a victim. You're so right. Yep, you are. I'm not gonna fight you. I, I can't fight your statement. If you're a victim, how far down do you want to go? How far down do you want to go? Do you want me to help you go as far down as possible? Because at the end of victimhood is suicide. That's the deal. At the end of you being a victim where the world doesn't serve you where your parents didn't serve you. They didn't help you. Uh, the government's supposed to be helping you. And there's this conversation called the top billionaires should be giving more. Don't get on that bandwagon, right? Get off of that one. If you think you breathing is important on the planet, get off the bandwagon. If you think money's important, but you're not willing to work for it, you're, the end of that course is you having you committing suicide 100% of the time. The end of being a victim is always your death premature by your hands. Wow. Because that's what victims do. Nobody wants to acknowledge that. Because if you're a victim and you don't take any responsibility for anything, like even a rape victim has some responsibility, they were in the wrong place at the wrong time. If you can't take 10% ownership of anything, you will eventually die. So the opposite of that is you could be anything you want to be, mm -hmm. anything. And your past doesn't mean anything to anybody. 
what would you put on the table? Like if Sander could, or Sabrina could be anything, what would she put on the table? Doesn't have to be that. What would, what were you willing to die for? So as you look at that, don't put victim there. So I don't fight people. If you're a victim, love it. There's competition for the bottom and it's really competitive to be the last person. It's very difficult to let go of the last place for first place, but nobody is competing for first place. Nobody, nobody's competing for first place. It's a simple process. Let go of everything that doesn't work. Stop doing bullshit in your life and you'll be first. You want to make a lot of money? Stop doing stuff that doesn't make money. It's that simple. It really, really that simple. Is. You can Google it. So yeah. we, the, that's what I realized. Uh, and why I wrote, the three simple things book is everybody's complicated things way too much. Not that there's not complicated things like delivering a baby is complicated. It's very complicated. There's a million problems and everything. All that stuff can be complicated until what you humans can only execute on three things effectively. Just three. You can only do three things. The fourth one makes it complicated come to find out in, in health, if you work out an hour a day and stretch every day and just drink two liters of water, you're one of the healthiest people that you ever meet. So what's stopping you from do that, doing that? Anybody can move, even a 400 pound person can find a way to move, even if it's his, his or her bicep, move, do something. Even if you roll around on the floor and it's embarrassing, it's still called movement come to find out if you just jog a four minute mile for 21 days straight, you can run a marathon having never jogged before. Cause I've 150 people I've gone from never running to running a marathon in two months and they do rather well. They're like, it's not possible. What do you mean? It's not possible. Sitting there doing nothing makes it impossible. Mm-hmm. So that's why I wrote the, sim the three simple things kind of variant. And there's other areas that you make things complicated that when you make them simple, you're lethal, crazy lethal. I love that you're saying this because, you know, one of the things that I started to realize in business is that <clears throat> if you have this ability to quiet your mind and like, just be self-aware of what you're saying, then you can start to control the outcome a whole lot more. And in doing my research on you, I was just thinking about what it takes to hunt, you know, and just mm. the stillness of how you have to be and, and learn patience. That was one of the hardest things that I had to learn in business. I had to learn how to be patient. Um, I wanted to hear this from, from, you know, your past, your experiences with hunting. Uh, how did that help you to learn how to deal with boredom? Because so many people today, Tom, are just like, I want it. I want it now. If I don't get it now, I'm going to quit. I'm going to do something else. You know, I'm going to go find myself. And sometimes I just want to say like, shut up, sit down and like, just stop talking. And let's like slowly get back to the basics, which is what your book is all about. Mm -hmm. Right. So what did hunting teach you that wow. we can then apply into business? So that uh, it, it's going to shock you. The, yeah. the, I think it's going to shock you. So hunting to me is the most active, mentally, physically active and draining event that I can do. Cause there's a billion things to consider the wind where the animals may have slept. Did you notice everything that you could possibly notice? Are you in the right spot? Uh, is your, gun set up? Did you, did you try to cover your scent? All the things that's just mentioning like six things that are going on. Come to find out if you look at animals too much, like if there's an animal in front of you and you stare at it, it affects them. So don't stare at an animal. I didn't know that until I was hunting with a, a guy that hunts for a living. He goes, when the animal walks out, take a look at it, but don't stare at it. Like, why would, what's that matter? He goes, I'm telling you, predator and prey have a weird relationship that you're not keen to. I'm like, wow. So it's very active. Mm -hmm. So to me, it's a very active environment that I 
it's involved. Like there's just a hundred percent involvement there. All my senses are keyed up. Uh, I pay attention to everything at the end of a five hour hunt. I'm exhausted and nowhere in there is there boredom. My son, however, is learning to hunt and he goes, dad, dad, it's boring. Like oh, think of all the things that you could think about, even get your phone. And if you want to check out mentally, because you, you know, can't look through the scope anymore, deal with something on your phone just to stay active, which wasn't the case when I was a kid. And, uh, so, but the, the other one is patience. So patience is a different conversation for me. Patience is how it's an emotional react reaction to something that's going on. If what's going on in front of you is making you react, you have multiple emotional responses to it. So if your kid screws something up, you could apply anger as an emotional response. You could apply patience because if you apply patience, what you're promising is I want, I'm going to stay here long. I'm going to stay here long enough until the response is what I want. So if they don't clean their room, patience, be patient. It'll eventually clean. It will get clean. If you act anger, you're going to piss them off and they're going to get angry and something's going to get broken because anger causes breakage hundred percent of the time or apply love to the situation, but love has a different outcome. Apply sadness because sadness leads to depression. Women often get sad because their kids don't do what they want them to do. So I bring it, bring it up as an emotional thing could because patience is an emotional conviction. You skipped over I love. Want this, you didn't say what love creates in the situation. What does love uh, lead it to? Love creates the other person being perfect the way that they are. Oh. If I love you, I don't see anything but greatness in you. Hatred only sees imperfection. Wow. And Cause you know, I don't know if you've ever really loved somebody. Then you look at them like, man, they're perfect the way that they are. You don't even see their faults. Yeah. And yeah, then two minutes so later, right. they could piss you off and yo, I see it there. You know what I mean? So <laughs> oh, right. in the moment of expressing love, the other person doesn't exist as something outside of you. And it's a, it's a wonderful thing to have, but nobody wants to experience that mastery level of emotion. So how you respond emotionally is entirely up to you as a human being. But to me, going back to patience is if you want something to happen, the only response that you should ever have is patience. Wow. If you want them to mature, if you want that oak to mature the first 10 years, you better not dig it up to see how the roots are growing. You just, Oh man, I want it now. Mm. People who want it now don't acquire patience. So they never get the outcome they want. People who are fed things without acquiring the patient skill set never get to something big. They get to a lot of small things because bigness comes with patience. You man, hmm. got to sit it through. Got to sit it through. It's not ready yet. The, the cake's not ready to eat. It looks pretty. Nope. Got to keep patient. The stock's up 5%. Nope. We're going to make it 15. Then it goes down to six or minus six. And then it goes up. Nope. We're going to sell at 15%. If you don't have patience, you never get there. I mean, this is the difference between a day trader and Warren Buffett, right? Who can just play the long-term game and yeah. cash out. Nothing building. wrong with playing yeah. short-term, but patience yeah. acquires big things. That's what it's supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And it's a hard skill set. Kids don't have patience. People, adults get patient when they get wise. Like, okay, if I had not done those 18 stupid things, I wouldn't be sitting here in prison by myself. Ooh, but I had just waited it out. It would have been better not to use that as an analogy. And I have no, not been I, in prison. I get <laughs> it. You know, I, I wanted to ask you this because when you go from being a Navy SEAL to then teaching Navy SEALs, you become what I call a leader of leaders. And how, what did you do to grow your skill set? Because I think for, for myself, when I started leading people in business, I, I realized when I was very immature because I was yelling and screaming and acting out of frustration to the point now where you can pull back, survey the situation, 
how did you grow your leadership skills in that environment to become a leader of leaders? Hmm. Uh, the easiest answer is in the SEAL teams. I wish it happened in every, I, I take what I learned from being a leader in the teams with me into business. Uh, if your skill set is not good, you cannot teach it. So you cannot teach something that you have not mastered. Mm -hmm. You can facilitate other people learning stuff that you have no idea about, but you can't lead it and teach it. So I, I'm a firm believer in the condition called lead by example, mm -hmm. but it's not up to you that they succeed. It's up to them. So I can teach you to shoot, but you have to do the work to shoot. I can show you, but you have to do the work. That type of leadership is called lead by example, but I'm not accountable. I can account for your results, but I'm not responsible for your outcome. I'm responsible for my own. In industry, we make leaders responsible for somebody's outcome. It's a horrible place to put a leader in because I, I'm, I can't control you. I can't control you. I can control you can me. Join maybe. A board, of, board of directors and companies and, and send this message down. Yeah. yeah. We want people to produce more and we're going to pay them for more. So it, it killed. Uh, it's a different way to do that. There's a wholly different way to do that uh, than what it's currently being articulated. It's the word responsibility and accountability are two terrible words. They're, they shouldn't be in business. And now that they're there, they've caused all kinds of issues. Uh, and you kind of can't pull them out. The other, the other way to look at it is we're, we're in this together. You and I are in this together. That's it. If you start from there, you'll come up with a different rendition of what to do. When the leader is in it with the team, it's a different problem than uh, you have to generate sales to still be here. In the SEAL teams, everybody goes out on the mission. Whoa, wait, everybody goes. You're going to have to go. So if you have a better idea than me, I'd be happy to hear it because we all have to go do bad stuff and then come out of it alive to protect ourselves and our family. So in a, in, I don't lead in the SEAL teams. I, I give people a problem that I'm really, I'm already committed to solving it, but I want the team to solve it. How would you guys do this? Cause you're going to go out and die if you don't figure it out. So how would you like to solve this problem? Once I figured out that's what real leadership is, is don't tell people what to do because they'll never do it. And you can't tell SEAL what to do. He hates being led. Are oh, you going to tell me to do that? I'm just going to watch you fall then, bro. You're done. And so I had to give them, I tasked them. The interesting thing in the SEAL teams that doesn't happen in business is SEALs are already always committed. Yes. They're already committed. In industry, nobody's committed until there's a predictable path to win. In the SEAL teams, the only way to find the path is to get committed. So we're going to figure this out. We're all going to die. Nope. We're, we're going to figure out the next three steps that we can do. Then the next three, and then the next three in business, everybody wants it to be perfectly designed on paper. And then we're going to put money down. We're not going to put money down until we see the end that it's a horrible thing. That's why private equity comes in and goes, here's the deal. We're going to make this turned around. If you're not interested, everybody leave. We'll just bring people who are committed into it, which is a terrible thing to do in a company. But the committed prior to knowing how it's solved is a, probably the best skill set to acquire in your life. Wow. <clears throat> you know, you said uh, in business, the two uh, worst words are accountability and responsibility. Mm -hmm. What would you say are two words that are good replacements instead of drilling down with that, with those two words, what would be two good replacements? Uh, we're in this together. Okay. And there's no way out. Wow. No way out. This is great. This is great. I, I love this. You know, in your book, you really go into 
some stuff about time and energy also, which mm -hmm. I love because I think people are more aware of this now. Um, but at the same time, you know, what COVID did to us is I think it took a little bit more of our wind out of us. Yes. hundred percent. What, what could you say to people about owning your time and your energy today? Like what are, and I love in your book and everyone needs to get this because when you break down those five key areas, and mm -hmm. then you give a detailed plan in the book about even the time mm -hmm. that you have to commit to on a daily basis for a minimum of 21 days, mm -hmm. to lay out that foundation. It's so, so amazing. And how does this relate to time and energy? Because this is where a lot of people are getting lost. They're yeah. just doing busy work and they're not doing the right work. Could you elaborate on that for the audience to make them understand, like you've got to gain control of your time and energy? Uh, the answer is imagine that there are certain elements of your life that are not supposed to be negotiated with. Like you're supposed to like, Hey, Sabrina, you, you have to breathe, whether you want to breathe or not, you have to control breathing. You know, you know what I'm saying? There are things that there are five areas of life come to find out. We all have that are not negotiable. Your body and your health, it's not a negotiation that you are healthy really matters. The second area is that your ability to continue to learn things like your brain, your brain really it's a data collecting device. It loves to collect data. Please stop taking data away from it. Give it a lot of data. The other area is what I call wealth or doing something that you value. So that's a third one. And then relationships, the one you have, the intimate ones you have really matter to you. They really do. Even the person in the cave that wants to be in isolation is sitting on a mat called their best relationship that they didn't have. So, and then spirituality, whatever, it's not really religion because religion means to relate backward, a current problem that you're having. That's a word, what religion actually means, which is terrible. So whether you're Catholic or Hindi or Islam or whatever. So those five areas, they're not negotiable every day of your life. You're not supposed to put off one for another. You're not supposed to. So how much then time do you dedicate to the various areas of your life? What it seems like to us, this partnership that we've had, and people have gone through the training, we've boiled it down to what I call a six-hour non-negotiable day. It actually doesn't even take that long to do three things. In your health, every day that ends in Y, you have to work out for an hour not 20 minutes. It's not intensity. It's a different thing. When you talk, you have to move your body for an hour a day. You actually have to stretch for 20 minutes a day. It doesn't have to be back to back, but throughout the day, don't sit down in the chair, stand up and stretch. Even if you stand up for a minute, and reach for the sky or whatever they call that sun salutation, do a little yoga. Nobody gives a fuck if you're embarrassed, do it. Mm -hmm. And then you have to stay hydrated. That's the key to human health is hydration, not what you eat. You want to get on a good diet, get on a keto diet. It's actually the best diet for all humans being all human beings. But anyway, work out, stretch and hydrate. It's simple. And it makes you amazing. It'll make you look different. And in, intellectually, and all that does is that takes maybe 90 minutes every day for the rest of your life, 90 minutes of health throughout the day. Throughout the day, spend five to 10 minutes learning something new, five to 10 minutes getting better at something you've already learned, and five to 10 minutes dreaming. Sit down and let yourself dream. Dream of being a unicorn, whatever the hell you want to dream about. Let your brain grow. Just dream about anything. And that takes maybe 15, maybe 30 minutes. Come to find out every day, the rest of your life, do something that you value. Get in, get in front of a new human being every day. In business world, that's called sales. 
if you ain't selling every day, you ain't going to last very long. And most businesses don't sell. They deal with existing customers and they outsource selling. So if you're a leader, you better be forcing yourself one. It takes about an hour to get in front of somebody or text somebody something. Mm -hmm. An hour, what we've found is spend an hour a day forcing newness into your business. New, new contracts, new clients, call somebody, thank them for something, something. And then an hour dealing with existing business. Whatever you have on the books, deal with at least spend an hour dealing with that. And then an hour in strategic conversation. Where are we going to be in five years? Like, hey, Sabrina, if we do this deal, what's going to happen in five years? Right. And let yourself think about that for about an hour. Which, so I thought those three areas would be remarkable to teach people. And it really makes a difference. This fourth area is the difference made to every human being that I've ever met. It's the most difficult. And if you want to transform your life, do it. And if you don't know what I'm saying, call me. I'll put everything down so you do these three, these three things. You need a key relationship in your life. I don't care if you're single. I don't care if you're homosexual, heterosexual. doesn't matter. You need one key relationship in your life. And in that relationship, you have to spend 10 minutes listening to the other human being without judging. Listen, listen, like you don't know who the hell she is. Listen, like anything she says is a miracle or he, if you want to look at it that way, listen without judgment. The greatest skill of leadership on the planet earth is listen without judgment. You're not the worst thing you can be as a leader is a fixer. If you're a fixer, you have an attrition rate in your company because people don't require you fixing them. The second one is speaking without drama to the, the key person in your relationship. Like my wife, me speaking without drama transformed her. Literally, no drama. Doesn't mean later. I, don't, I can add drama later, but during this 30 minutes. <clears throat> and the last 10 minutes are intimacy. If you want to call it love languages, Sabrina, if you like acts of service, we're married. I have to go produce an act of service. Uh, I'm physical, so Stacy gets groped. That's the deal. She understands my <laughs> language, and she expects it, 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 or she wants something. Whatever she th requires intimately, I have to give her. Come to find out, close to 500 people have tried that, and they, it's a part of the training. It takes leaders three to four months to have 21 days consecutively listening, speaking, and having intimacy with their spouse. I'm like, what? What do you mean? It can't be that hard. It's hard. When you do it, everything, the moment you do it, 21 days consecutive, on day 22, your life is different, your spouse's life is different, and your business is making money like you cannot imagine, and you're healthy. It's wonderful. I didn't think that would be the case. And then spiritually is a routine, how you wake up and how you go to bed every night. It takes totally 20 minutes cumulative to have a routine of awakening yourself up and putting yourself to sleep. And when those five areas get what I call three simple things in five areas, your life is different. It's magnificent. I think this is what we all want. We want to have a magnificent life. You know, you said something so amazing um, about uh, your wife in the first book that I read about you. It was, it was beautifully written. It was very well written where you were just talking about your relationship and being open with that. And what I love about your wife is that she is strong and you guys have a great relationship where she is able to see your weaknesses because a strong woman will see whatever mm. is in a man. And then you guys work through it. And in your book, you said a Spartan woman never compromises her strength for a man's weakness. Mm -hmm. You know, if you could talk about this, because I think today 
women, and I say this, like, I think we're getting this a little bit confused where we're associating strength with independence and we're not associating strength with oneness. And Mm. you make this connection in your book where you say like, you are one when you're talking about relationships, I am one, Mm. you know, and, and when you say your vows to someone, when you're getting married, you literally you hear these words, they have to become you to become one. What I do to you, I am doing to myself. Mm -hmm. So could you talk about this for people, especially, you know, when, you know, two things, you're in a new relationship, you have an opportunity to set yourself up to have like a a better relationship long-term. And then the other one would be when you're in a long relationship and it's gone you know, awry, how do you bring it back together? What would you Uh, recommend in those two uh, situations? There's probably three different styles, you know, before you're actually committed during the committed. And then when things go awry, uh, the same paradigm exists. Okay. Uh, um, Individuality is required to be a human being. You, I need my Mm -hmm. self-expression. I need to express myself in various areas of my life. Like physically, I want to express myself. It's kind of up to me as long as I'm not doing damage to you, to my business, to express myself a certain way. Can things go awry with that? I don't know. Maybe walking around naked outside, maybe a little bit too far in self-expression. I'm saying this because everybody's like, I want to have my life and I don't want to be tied to somebody. So self-expression must be there hundred percent. If you and I are engaged in a relationship, I pray that you get to the tether, the end of the tether of your self-expression. Like, uh, I don't know if you should go that far, but come pull it back a little bit. If you want to run, if you want to go on vacation, if you want to put pink in your hair, if that's where you are, let it be expressed. But oneness is how you become powerful beyond measure. If you think being independent, like I want to be an independent woman and compete with men, why the fuck would you want to do that? Men don't like to compete with men because it's ruthless. Competition is ruthless. That doesn't mean that you actually achieve anything because you beat out other people for the spot. It's different than oneness at home. If you attain oneness at home, you could achieve 18 number one spots. If you try to do it yourself, you'll get to one. So as women try to understand that, as men try to understand, I need my independence. You'll get there. You'll get there, but you ain't going to get 18 of them. Wow. You're not going to perpetuate success because in a relationship with the, with the man's, with the woman in front, say the woman's in front, the woman will collapse under pressure without a man protecting the things that he needs to protect in a woman. That that's the deal. Women need things protected in them. Men need get off your fucking ass and go back to work. They need that from the woman. We want you to go, woman has to say to a man, go forward. And if you don't come home with the money, don't fucking come home. Stop being a bitch. All that stuff. It comes from a strong woman because the men be like, I'd rather just go drink, man. I don't really want to do this shit anymore. So women drive hard men, hard men, hard women drive hard men. Hard men encourage hard women to get back to it when they get their ass kicked. A woman won't get her ass kicked many times without a man at home going, Hey, you're still awesome. They'll, they'll fall apart. Doesn't make us less for having that difference. But the, there's four pillars to what we call Spartan woman. You brought up the the first pillar. The first pillar is never compromise your, your strength for his weakness. Never, ever. Never compromise something that I'm strong about as a human being for somebody else's incapacity to do it. So if you're strong, if I'm weak at something, right? Um, 
have an emotional outburst every time I come home because we don't make money. If you cower to that, our relationship is on the trend of being over already. If you don't show up your best version just because I'm a douche, the relationship's already going to fall apart. So what Stacy does is I call it the five minute timer. When I'm in there being a dumbass, or my kids are being a dumbass. She's like, "All right, I'm not going to respond to this. Y'all have five minutes. Douche away, you <laughs> assholes. You got five minutes, but and then when it's over, that's it. Yeah, you're done. So you can be angry, you can be pissed off." but I'm not going to then cower and go, Oh my gosh, you know, it is me. And so she never cowers away from her being strong. And I, it's the five minute clock that we do at our house and do that. If a man's being an asshole, call him out. You're being an asshole. You can do it for five minutes. Go ahead. Cause I know you need to blow up on me, but it ain't me. I'm not going to, I'm not going to then cower to you just because you're an idiot. Say that say he comes home drunk. Stand up for yourself. Well, he's going to hit me. If you let him get away with the first time, you might as well get divorced. So what if you just stood up for how strong you are as a woman in the face of all the stupid things that men do? Then it changes. You want to see men change? Have a woman stand up to him. He'll, he'll change. I mean, they'll change or they'll run away. <laughs> yep. He'll, he'll change or run away. Yep. And now you'll know. But now you haven't compromised anything. You're actually more powerful. Now, shit, what am I going to do? Now I have to actually own the fact that I can transform people. It's a hard conversation for women too. own it. You know, see, if you look at a pack of animals, there's two leaders, the alpha female and the alpha male. Nowhere in, nowhere in nature is there an alpha male running anything. There's an alpha female and an alpha male everywhere except for humans we think we're so badass that we can do it ourselves it doesn't happen everywhere that we're structured to be together like we're we fit together so let us fit together i mean Supposed that's to how be we together. create <laughs> together yeah. yeah and create yeah and woman has to, women has to stand up they have to be strong there was a period of time when i think they were i think they have gotten off the rail Men are always assholes. There's no way around that curve, but a strong mm -hmm. woman, strong woman is always going to be like, okay, five minute asshole. We should video this. Like she actually said that let's, we just, can we just YouTube this next time? I'm like, no, 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 I'm good. <laughs> Two minutes in, I'm out. Okay. It's good. <laughs> this is so good. You know, Tom, I could talk to you forever. Um, I think that you're an incredible human being and just in meeting you, it's an energy that you have to yourself that is a blessing to this world. So I just want to say like, thank you for your life. Thank you for your living at the level that you do. You know, I, I, I hope I'm honored to meet your wife one day. And I just really want to say to everyone, this is a book that you really want your children to read for you read it first get this into your blood. And then my children will be reading this book and we will become this because I think for, for everyone, you know, the, the family is an important thing. And I, it, it really, it makes me sad when I think about families that don't have something to rally around that they don't have like an ethos or a principle or something that they can come around. So I think it's beautiful what you've created mm -hmm. because it will outlast you. My last question to you is, <clears throat> you know, what makes you rare when you are no longer here? What will the world miss because your presence is no longer here? Mm. Uh, boy, that's a weird way of ask, uh, asking the legacy conversation. What makes me rare? And then what would happen when I'm gone? Uh, I, I would answer it two ways. What makes me rare is that when I make a promise, I keep it. And the legacy that I would like to have is at least one other person that I've imparted that information to can make a promise and keep it. I think it's the greatest okay. gift that you have as a human being is to say something and have it actually become true. That's an amazing gift to have. And nobody shares that, that level of, wow, that's a gift. I can make a, I can say something and it become true. 
I've seen it now five times in my life. Didn't, it wasn't there until I said it. And then I said it long enough and it happened. SEAL training was that way. Uh, combat was that way. We have died, supposed to die many times. Business is transformed by making a promise and keeping it, watching it fall apart and starting it back over and relationship. It's always graceful to hear when people say that you're in a great relationship and then you see your own relationship fall apart because about a year ago, I'd, uh, my back had two, three lumbar discs had collapsed, couldn't walk. I was in the given up on myself and given up on our relationship. Cause man, if I can't walk around, I don't have a job. And, and I started getting down on myself and Stacy was there going, man, what do we do? And she was going through menopause and all the women that have that experience is they start falling apart too. So one of my partners came in and had to put us through our own training, like, man, y'all getting off the rail. So let's go through the training and get you two back on the rail. I'm like, I do the training every day. I'm like you crazy. So I realized I wasn't keeping my promise. I had kind of given up on the language of our relationship together and I wanted it to be what it could have been instead of what it actually is. And when, when we got in alignment with each other again, I was like, Oh my Lord, I didn't know her. I'm like, wow, this is an amazing woman that I thought was 10 times more amazing now. And we redesigned the whole business because it had gone off the rail. And, uh, I say that because we had stopped making small promises and keeping them. Mm -hmm. And we started making tons of money. And then you stop making small promises and keeping them. Ooh, it was brutal. It was a brutal endeavor. I hate the fact that my training actually works <laughs> and putting myself through it. I had never gone through it. I'd put everybody else through it. I'm like, Oh my gosh. And uh, transformed our kids too, because they got to see their dad authentically for the first time. I had to kind of confess some miserable pain that I was in. And my son finally understood why I was an asshole to him. He's oh my gosh, dad, I understand now. And, uh, that's what I think is the legacy of that I would like to leave behind is an authentic conversation with another human being that they can make a promise and keep it and have it sustain their life. Wow. Uh, you know, this will be one of these moments where I'm going to go and rewatch our conversation and just, you know, with a, with a pen and a notepad with your book. I had like a whole thing uh, that I wanted to do with you where you have like power lines in your book where you should be like, you know, we live in a meme world. You have so many memes in your book to, to create, but I, I really just say like, thank you. It's been an honor and a pleasure. Um, and I look forward to uh, speaking with you again. Thank awesome. you so much for your time. Awesome. Thank you for having me. Appreciate you.